What's up, everybody? It's Trey Smith. Welcome to another episode of the College Game Time Podcast. We are the fastest growing show for the American Athletic Conference. And you know what today is. It's most likely Tuesday. And I'm also going to do what I did last week and give you a trending topic Tuesday. Because we have a trending topic out of the American Athletic Conference right now uh, that I want to touch on in SMU. And then, of course, I'm going to give you my most likely twos for week four in the American Athletic Conference. But before I get into it, you know what to do. If you're watching on YouTube right now, like, subscribe, watch it to the end, share it with a friend, leave a comment. I know I said all that a little bit wrong, but you know what I mean. And if you're listening on one of the streaming platforms like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave a five-star rating. And if you feel compelled, write me a review. Again, it helps kick the podcast up to the algorithm where more people can see it. And if you didn't catch it yesterday, I did go viral on TikTok over the weekend. Got a video that I posted. It's at 1.2 million views right now. Actually, I don't know if that's considered viral. Uh, I don't even know anymore what's what's viral and what's not. But if you're in the TikTok world, come follow me. Uh, again, it's same as YouTube, College Game Time. I recently started tapping back into posting content on TikTok last week, actually, and uh, went viral uh, on Saturday. Well, from Saturday to now. So anyways, if you're in that world, follow me over there. But uh, let's get to it today. So I'm going to start with trending topic Tuesday. Most of you have probably seen the report about the SMU boosters who raised over a hundred million dollars in seven days after the news was official that the SMU Mustangs would be joining the ACC, um, essentially being in a power conference for the first time ever, really, because in the 80s, that really wasn't the structure. But the Southwest Conference would have been considered a power conference back then. And so really, since the early 80s, uh, the SMU is, um, yeah, or, or since I, say, I should say the, the, the early 90s when the Southwest Conference disbanded. But by that point, it had lost a lot of its luster that it had in the 80s. Um, here's the thing, man, and I, I've been consistent with this all off season. Even when there were some, you know, back when SMU was still linked to the pack and some stuff started leaking out that, well, they may have to come in at a reduced share or to no share. Like I got on this channel and said, like, money's not a problem for SMU. Like never has been, never will be. Um, It's kind of cool as someone who's raised in the heartland of Southwest Conference country uh, to see these boosters motivated again, like they never have been. And that's one thing that I've, I've been saying as well is that the SMU that we're going to see in the ACC as it pertains to financial support is not the same SMU that we've been seeing in the AAC or the CUSA before that, or the WAC before that. Okay. You're about to see a, a, a complete, overhaul or transformation of the financial support and resources. And I wouldn't be shocked if the facilities, even though obviously they're, they're, they're doing the um, add on with one of the end zones right now, but I wouldn't be shocked to start to see that amp up as well. But here's what I want to say. There's two um, cautions that I have for SMU fans, and even the SMU boosters, okay? And the first one is this. This ain't the 80s. If you're an SMU fan, if you're an SMU booster, you gotta go into this remembering and understanding this is not the 80s, okay? To be a national power back in the 80s, you just had to dominate your region. If you dominated your region, you'd have a chance to compete for a national championship. That was the the structure of the college football landscape back then. So if you think about uh, when all the money was flowing through in those early 80s days, that window from 1980 to 1984, when SMU won more games in that stretch than any other time in school history, they became a national power. They competed for national championships. They had the Pony Express. Now they've got the 30 for 30 on all the, the money that was flowing through. But the truth is, is if you really look at that era of SMU football, they didn't dominate at the national level. They dominated at the regional level. But because of the landscape, it made them a national power. So listen to this study. 
From 1980 to 1984, a five-year window. Do you know how many out-of-state Division I regular season opponents SMU played? A five-year window. How many Division I regular season opponents that were an out-of-state team that SMU played? Nine. Just under two per year. Okay, that is no longer the reality. In other words, they basically played eight or nine Texas teams per year during that window. So when they were getting all those big time recruits, basically, as long as you bought the best players in Texas, you were good. Now, I'm not saying they didn't also get some uh, players from, you know, at the national level, but most of those teams consisted of the top players in the state of Texas. That's no longer the blueprint for competing at the national level. Um, because nowadays you can't, you can't compete for a national championship without having to play the Bamas, the Georgias, the Ohio States, the Michigans, teams from Florida, teams from the West coast, whoever's hot right now from those different regions, you can't compete for a national title and at the national level without going through those teams. And the reason why I bring that up is because I, I know there's a lot of excitement right now for SMU, rightfully so, understandably so, but there's also almost a lot of like some arrogance that's coming out thinking that, oh yeah, the boosters had just come alive. Here we go. And it's like, well, don't think it's just going to be like the eighties because back in the eighties, all that money flowed and SMU became a national brand. That doesn't necessarily mean that's going to translate to playing in a conference that's predominantly on the East coast. Um, now I'm not saying it won't, don't get me wrong. Not saying it won't, at all. I'm just saying we're in a totally different landscape than what SMU dominated during the eighties. Um, you know, I mean, quite frankly, that 81 or 82 season, whatever it was, they played two out of state opponents. And I think their bowl game, the cotton bowl, which was in Dallas was against Pitt or somebody. Um, I think that was the year they went undefeated, but had the tie cause he played for the tie or whatever. Could have been the national championship year, consensus national championship year. Um, so that's just a thought to consider if you're following this from SMU's perspective. Look, I'm not saying don't be excited. I'm not saying that we're not about to see some significant elevations of that program because of the infuse of money that's going to be coming in and support. I also just, I'm not ready to sit here and say, oh man, it's going to be like it was in the 80s. Because if you, wasn't really until I started looking into this where I was like, man, really back in that era, they really just had to dominate Texas, which they did. But now you really have to be able to dominate and compete across the entire landscape. Will this move be enough? Will SMU be attractive enough, you know, beyond the booster money for the athletes that you need to come in to be able to compete at that level? That's what I think is to be determined. And I believe that's a fair take. The other thing to consider, if you're an SMU fan, I call it the, the cowboy syndrome. You have to be mindful of the cowboy syndrome. What does that mean? Well, the Dallas Cowboys right now have the most valuable franchise, one of the most valuable franchises in all of professional sports. Yet they haven't sniffed an NFC championship game since 1995. Why? Well, one would argue that the money that pays for the players and pays the players isn't satisfied with simply paying for the players. But it also wants to have a say in who those players are and what those players do. So what does that mean for SMU? Are we so sure that as these boosters begin to put all this money into this program, that they're not going to want to have a say in who, which kids, I mean, that was the issue. That was an issue in the eighties. So then you start to wonder, okay, who's really controlling this program? Is it the head ball coach? Is it these outer voices? You know, and that's where things can also begin to get tricky. You start to bring guys in. Maybe it's not a guy that you really wanted, but it's a guy that this dude with money wanted. And so now he's in the program and even the Longhorns. I mean, I know Sark's doing his thing right now, but since Mac Brown, 
And really at the tail end of the Mac Brown era, I mean, that's kind of been the story of their program. It's, it's the outside voices that are impacting what's happening internally, the outside voices and the outside money. So those are just two things that I'm going to be keeping an eye on as SMU looks to make this transition. Um, you know, I kind of went on that rabbit trail when I saw that that trending uh, that they raised a hundred million in seven days. And look, I, I mean, I'm not surprised by that. I mean, anyone who knows anything about SMU and, and the the financial support that's around that program, because I know what the, what the argument against SMU to the ACC has been from other fans, you know, from other conferences or or other fans of Texas teams or even fans of, of teams in the American conference. It's like, Oh, y'all can't even win the AAC. How are y'all going to go win the ACC now? Well, that's fair one, but two, I think the amount of financial support that's going to come in as we're already seeing because they're considered power five, it, it kind of ups the ante from that standpoint. I remember I was at the SMU campus 10, 10, 12 years ago, talking to a guy who's, pretty pretty closely connected uh, with some of the, the big-time players around that program, financial players, not like on-field players, like, like financial people. And this was like 2012, 2013. He was like, yeah, there's just – he's like, it's not that the support isn't, he isn't there. It's just not motivated right now to, to dump anything into this program. And so – kind of what he was talking about at that point in time is how much further and further behind the SMU football program was falling. And this was right around that era when like Jimbo or uh, June Jones uh, just kind of, I don't know, threw in the towel or whatever it was. And anyways, those are just my thoughts on SMU. Two things to consider. It ain't the 80s and the cowboy syndrome. Outside of that, best of luck to you. And uh, quite frankly, to transition into most likely twos, my number one most likely two is to pull off an upset is SMU. I think SMU is going to win the game this weekend against TCU. There is this part of me, and I got to be careful because I'm not ready to like say this officially. Maybe by Friday I will be, but there's a part of me that thinks SMU might win this game convincingly. I know it's a rivalry game. I know it's pretty evenly matched. I just think SMU has the advantage at a lot of key positions, particularly up front and at quarterback. A um, couple of you had commented yesterday on that about TCU having the advantage with, with the secondary and with the uh, running backs, uh, which is fair. I, I don't, I think though, if you look at the entire running back room compared to the entire running back room, not just the top one guy, I think you have more of an argument for SMU. Uh, and then I think someone had said the O-line. And again, man, I, I, know, I know TCU's O-line has the kid that came in from Bama. I just, I don't know, man. I think SMU's run game, their rushing attack's good. And um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not ready to say it officially, but I will say officially I think SMU wins that game. And they are a, uh, uh, TCU's a six and a half point favorite in that one. So that's my most, that's the number one most likely to, to pull off the upset is SMU over TCU. Uh, most likely to cover the spread. Um, cover the spread as the favorite. <sighs> this one I struggle with. And I'm not going to change up right now that I'm on the air officially. But just hear me out. So I've got Rice minus two and a half covering at USF. Now, I will say, this could be the game that completely flips the momentum and the trajectory of USF's season. They're coming off the very competitive game against Bama, but they did lose. Um, so they've got some momentum. They've got some confidence. And they could really begin to change the tide or the trajectory of their season with a win this weekend over Rice. But man, here's the thing. Here's where I'm hesitant. You know, Bama's, they're Bama, but they're still figuring out their quarterback situation. Whereas you got Rice right now, they're cooking. JT Daniels has found his touch these last couple of weeks. Now they got really stifled against Texas um, in week one. But 
he came back against Houston, looked like a different player. And then, of course, they had they had the tune-up game last week. And um, he, again, though, I mean, just just balling right now. And that offense, they, they have some explosiveness. And I'm also looking at, you know, you can take this argument one way or the other, right? USF is coming off of playing Bama. Like, you're going to feel, you're still going to feel that one. That was a very aggressive, physical game. Whereas you got Rice coming off a, a more of a cupcake game. So, so on one hand, you could say Rice is going to be healthier. Rice is going to be, I don't know, um, um, not still feeling the effects of the game the week before. But then on the flip side, You've got the battle-tested argument where you've got USF who just went toe-to-toe with Bama for four quarters, and now they're coming in to play Rice. They're on their home field, and who knows? I don't know what the conditions are looking like for, for Saturday in Tampa, but if it's anything like last week, that in, that in and of itself could have an impact on this Rice offense. So I'm still sticking with it. I think Rice does win by a field goal. I'm not saying this is going to be a blowout necessarily, but I think we're going to learn a lot about this Rice team this weekend. Like, are they for real? You know, could Rice be what a lot of us thought UTSA was going to be this season? Meaning, being that team that comes in year one to the American and immediately contends for the conference? Uh, I said it a couple weeks ago, looking at Rice's schedule. Tell me they can't win the next six or the next five. I don't remember what it was. I think it was win the next five. Um, This is one of those games. Uh, I think it's all building up to their matchup with Tulane in a few weeks. But I think that's going to be a good game. I think it's going to be a really good game. That's a game that's on ESPN. I'm not sure which ESPN it's on, but I can look right now. Uh, uh, ESPNU. So that's a 3 3 p.m. Central Time kick on ESPNU. And uh, yeah, I, that, but that's, my, that's who I've got covering the spread as a favorite this week is Rice minus two and a half over at USF. Uh, most likely to cover the spread as the dog. I've got Memphis. They're plus seven at Missouri. Well, at Missouri, well, at, at Missouri in St. Louis. So that game is in St. Louis. Um, guys, I think Memphis can win that game. I said it last week. The thing that does scare me a little bit about Memphis's chances in this one is say what you want about uh, Eli Drinkwitz, okay, Coach Drink. You know, I know people have all different kinds of things they say about him and he rubs people a certain way and, uh, I mean, whatever. Say what you want about that dude. But where you have to give him credit is when it comes to scheming up a a run game plan, like a rushing attack for a game, He's one of the best. And what we saw with Memphis last week against Navy was some struggles to stop the run. Now, it was a totally different style of run game. I talked about that last week and how it was a lot of paralysis by analysis, but there were also a lot of missed tackles. So I'm curious to see what this run game looks like for Missouri, uh, what their running run game game plan is against Memphis because I'm willing to bet it's going to be uh, pretty well prepared. Uh, but I think Seth Hennigan is going to have to come to play. Uh, I think that, that secondary is going to have to come to play because Missouri's got some go daddies on the edges. Um, but I do. I think, I think Memphis, I think they can win this game. Uh, but I, I for sure think they cover plus seven. And um, yeah, so most likely to pull off an upset. I've got SMU at plus six and a half or against TCU. Uh, most likely to cover the spread as a favorite. I've got uh, Rice minus two and a half at USF. And then to cover the spread as a dog, I've got Memphis uh, against Missouri in St. Louis, Missouri being the seven point favorites. Most likely to go over. Man, to me, I feel like this is a lock, but then I keep going back and forth on it. And that's Tulsa NIU at 53 and a half. Tulsa can score points. I know they haven't scored much the past couple of weeks because, uh, well, um, um, they've, they've, I mean, who was it? It was OU and Washington, right? Two, 
two teams that could be competing for a playoff spot before the season's said and done. I don't know, but we'll see. But they have an explosive offense. Still not real sure what their defense is. Don't know that they're going to be able to stop Northern Illinois. And it's crazy because NIU is favored in this game. Let me pull it back up. Sorry, I just had it on my screen and then I lost it. Yeah, NIU is a three and a half point favorite. So, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know it's it's in Illinois. I don't know what the what the weather is right now. It says it's sixty four degrees. I mean, that's perfect football weather. So I, I'm I'd like to think we see that explosive Tulsa offense that we saw in week one, particularly in that second quarter, and we saw flashes of it the last two weeks. Uh, this is a more evenly matched game. You know, I, I don't think. 35, 28, 35, 31, 42, 41, 31. Like, I don't think a score like that is out of the question. So I'm going to go with that game as my over 53 and a half. And then, of course, as I always do, CFB game of the week. Man, take your pick. It's a toss-up between Rice, USF, SMU, TCU, Memphis, Mizzou. Um. And then I just realized I did skip over another one of my, my trending topic Tuesdays. It was just Army. I think I said it yesterday. They extended Munkin, and it does appear that talks between um, Army and the American Athletic Conference are continuing to heat up. Things should start to take shape here in the next couple weeks or so, probably by the end of September. I think Army extending Munkin is a good sign. Not only has he performed well, I mean, he's had – multiple eight plus nine plus 10 plus win seasons in the last five, six years, but securing him, um, you know, I think that's going to be a quality program coming into the conference, but is that it? Most likely twos. I got the upset covering the spread as the favorite, as the dog, the over CFB game of the week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow I'm looking at a possible discussion about a what how the dominoes could fall that might lead to westward expansion opening back up for the AAC so there's your little teaser for tomorrow if not tomorrow it'll for sure be Thursday but I'm pretty confident that's what I'm going to go over tomorrow is what dominoes falling might open westward expansion back up for the American so that's it that's all I got today um, uh, trending topic Tuesday, most likely Tuesday. Uh, and until tomorrow, that's it for me today. Trey Smith, college game time.